Hello and welcome to the Friday, August 21st, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. One of the issues that came up during the Sands data incident this month was Outlook 365 forwarding rules. And essentially what the attacker did here was add forwarding rules in order to receive copies of certain emails. And this is a technique that has been used quite regularly, in particular in the realm of business email compromise attacks. One reason that SANS was able to detect uh, this particular attack was auditing off of those mail forwarding rules. And today, Rob has a PowerShell script for you to do so relatively easily. And if you are saying that, hey, uh, it's probably way too many of these rules uh, to really figure out uh, what's legit, what's not legit, you have to start uh, somewhere. And of course, what you will be looking for going forward is any changes to those rules. And that may give you a hint as to where to look first. And talking about email, one common problem, of course, with email is that it's difficult for the user to discern the actual source of an email. Now, over the years, there have been some automated protocols to make it easier for mail servers to classify spoofed email, for example, SPF and DMARC. But apparently Google had an interesting bug that allowed you to bypass these policies for G Suite and Gmail users. The problem here was twofold. First of all, it is possible to forward an email to an arbitrary recipient. Now, similar features often require that you first uh, verify that you own the receiving email address, but not so with uh, Gmail. In addition, it was possible to specify an incoming mail server, which you trust, which of course, as Google described, is often used for initial filters like spam filters and the like. So you can actually set up a certain mail server and then this mail server will be trusted by Gmail, so any email will be accepted for, from this mail server. Of course, the downfall here is that then you can forward this email using the feature I mentioned first, and the combination of these two features essentially comes down to a bypass of SPF and DMARC policies. Alison Hussein, who discovered this vulnerability back in April, did report it to Google and has worked since then with Google to have it fixed. Shortly after the blog post was published, Google did indeed release a fix. And of course, one of the first things that malware often does once it gains a foothold on the system is trying to disable anti-malware. And one program they definitely want to get rid of is, of course, Windows Defender, which tends to be the default anti-malware on most systems. Now, there used to be a pretty easy way to do that, the disable anti-spyware group policy. Setting this registry key would disable Microsoft Defender or Windows Defender. And the intention of this disable anti-spyware key was to allow other anti-malware, if you install it, to make sure that uh, Windows Defender is turned off and to avoid any conflict between having multiple anti-malware running on one system. Now, the initial fix that uh, Microsoft applied over a year ago, I believe, was tamper protection. With tamper protection enabled, the change could still be made, but would be undone once the system reboots. So yeah, you could still get some protection from anti-malware until the system is rebooted. But Microsoft decided now to essentially get rid of the disable anti-spyware registry key and group policy. So if you still have it set, it really has no effect. As far as the conflict goes between uh, Microsoft Defender and other anti-malware products, Microsoft states that its product has become intelligent enough to identify if other anti-malware is running and it will automatically disable itself. 
And then we got an interesting paper from Singapore that may make some interesting sort of light weekend reading. And it's about deducting the shape of a key based on the noise it makes when you insert it into a lock and open the door. Actually, what they're really looking for here is as you insert the key, the length of the pins in your standard pin tumbler lock apparently makes sufficiently different noise based on the height of the key bidding in order to deduct at least in some ways or reduce the number of keys that could possibly open the lock. Apparently they're sort of able to limit it or narrow it down to sort of three or so different possible key biddings that would then open the lock. Personally, I think a little bit skeptical how well this will work sort of under real world circumstances and again they're dealing sort of with relatively straightforward pin tumbler locks which usually are not that difficult to pick at least if you're watching like the lock picking lawyers and youtube videos like that so uh, we'll see what happens with this if this becomes an actual practical attack but uh, so far really more sort of a little curiosity well, and is it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.